Thank you for coming to our talk. Today we will be talking about how we do fuzzing of real-world software at production scale of tens of thousands of cores and in a fully automated way. I'm Abhishek. I'm from the Google Chrome security team. And I founded ClusterFuzz eight years back with just like a single machine under my desk. And now it has grown into a massive compute cluster of 25,000 cores. And I'm Oliver. I'm the lead developer of ClusterFuzz and the tech lead for OSSFuzz. So why do we do fuzzing? Fuzzing is a really interesting way to find bugs. Think of it like pushing a program so hard that it just falls off a cliff into this unexpected state. And this really turns up interesting memory corruption issues. Let me talk a little bit about the history of fuzzing. Fuzzing really became prominent in 2013 when American Fuzzy Lop, or AFL, launched. This was an effort by Michael Zelensky uh, in his time at Google. And this really started an era of smart fuzzing. Fuzzing was really not blind anymore. It had this code coverage feedback loop, which would continuously improve fuzzing over time. A year later, Kostya from Dynamic Tools team, also at Google, launched LipFuzzer. And this made uh, fuzzer writing as simple as unit test. In December of 2016, our team launched OSS Fuzz, which made fuzzing a seamless experience for the open source developers. These open source developers are already constrained by time and resources. So making things simple is really important. Right now, we have 250 open source projects integrated with the service. So think of your popular crypto library like OpenSSL, or XML library like libxml2, or font library freetype, or image parsing libraries like ImageMagick, libpng. All of those are integrated with this service. So let's bust some myths first. These are some fuzzing myths which we have heard over the years and wanted to clear them up front before diving deeper. One of the first things we hear quite a lot is fuzzing is only for security researchers or security teams. This is not really true. We have worked with hundreds of developers and they enjoy fuzzing if it's seamlessly integrated in their workflows. The second myth we have heard quite a lot is fuzzing only finds security vulnerabilities. This is also not true. Fuzzing has been used to find very critical stability vulnerabilities as well, like those pesky null pointer D references. <laughs> Another myth we hear quite a lot is we don't need fuzzing because our project is very well unit tested. You have to understand that unit testing only tests a small subset of the expected input search space. So to give you an example, SQLite library claims to have 100% branch test coverage. But when we added structure-aware fuzzers, we started finding dozens of new security vulnerabilities. And finally, my favorite one is people feel their project is secure if there are no open bugs. That's also not true. You really need to see what quality of fuzzers you have and the code coverage they achieve. If you have really bad and inefficient fuzzers that, let's say, are running into constant error conditions, you won't really find new bugs and always have a false sense of security. So how do we really scale this fuzzing? One of the first things that comes to a person's mind is, let's just add more machines or more VMs to this problem, and that solves it. As a defender, that's not the only problem you have. You need to have scalable fuzzing processes. Another thing you have to understand is, your security team, no matter what size it is, let's say one person, two person, 10 persons, even more, cannot really scale 
to writing and maintaining all the fuzzers for your project. Developers, on the other hand, understand the code much better and can write more efficient and complete fuzzers. And finally, fuzzing is really scalable if it's seamlessly integrated in the software development lifecycle. So your developers don't need to know the complexity of your fuzzing subsystem. All they need to do is input a fuzzer and check it as part of the code base and get as output two things. One is the bugs that they are expecting or not expecting. And the other thing is ways to improve the fuzzer that they have already written. So what does an ideal fuzzing workflow look like? In our ideal fuzzing workflow, developer is the initiator of this fuzzing workflow. They write a fuzzer, check it into source, then the build system picks it and puts it on a cloud storage location. Then thousands of these fuzzing bots kick in, start finding hundreds of new crashes. Then the subsystem automatically deduplicates them on, on, to a set of unique bugs. We also attach some extra metadata to the crash. So things like, who really introduced this regression? What's the minimized crash looks like? And so on. Once we do that, we file the bug either to that same developer who wrote the fuzzer or the developer who introduced that regression. After that, this developer fixes the bug. And finally, there is a daily cron job that runs that tries to verify if this fix was actually correct and automatically close the bug. So what is Clusterfuzz? Clusterfuzz project is actually an implementation of this fuzzing workflow that I just described. It, it has been open source in February of this year and is actively developed and maintained. It automates everything in this fuzzing workflow except of fuzzer writing and bug fixing. It has been tested at scale for like smaller projects with let's say a few dozen cores or a wide variety of projects on tens of thousands of cores. It's the only public uh, example of an infrastructure that runs on all popular platforms. So it works on Linux, Mac, Windows, and Android. It powers our OSS first service and all of Google's fuzzing. So let's go over the fuzzing lifecycle in more detail. With that, I hand over to my colleague, Oliver. Thank you, Abhishek. So obviously, the first step of starting fuzzing at all is to write fuzzes. And I'll give an overview of how we've approached this in the various projects we've worked on. So um, before we write any fuzzes, we have to figure out what we want to fuzz. So this should start with a tax surface enumeration, uh, where we look for where untrusted input is consumed in our program. And this is obviously specific to every application. So let's take a look at an example at Chrome, which is a web browser. Uh, so Chrome has a multi-process model, and we have a sandbox renderer process, which is directly exposed to bad untrusted input, such as HTML, JavaScript, uh, images, video. Um, so these are all obviously things that we need to be fuzzed. Uh, we also have more privileged processes in Chrome, which aren't as exposed directly to untrusted input, but they host these very privileged IPC services that could potentially be exploited by a compromised renderer process. So IPC, processes, uh, IPC services are something that we also want to fuzz. Otherwise, they might cause uh, sandbox escapes. So beyond attack surface enumeration, another way to look for things are uh, to look for third-party libraries. So we've encountered countless, um, countless third-party libraries, and we found that most of them are actually severely lacking in quality and can be extremely buggy in nature. So they're obviously things that you want to fuzz. And parsers, and more generally, any complicated processing of input data is another thing that you want to fuzz. Fuzzers tend to do very well on this kind of code. 
And finally, if you have a vulnerability rewards program, you can use the reports that you get from there uh, as a feedback for where you might be missing out on fuzzy coverage. OK, so now onto some actual fuzzing. Um, so the based, most basic form of fuzzing is known as black box fuzzing. A black box fuzzer is just a program that generates or mutates files of a particular format. Say, for example, you might have a HTML parser fuzzer. This will just be a program which spits out random but valid HTML files. And then these files are fed one by one to a target application, say, for example, Chrome, in the hopes of triggering a crash. And these black box fuzzers can generate uh, these test cases completely from scratch, or they can parse and mutate existing test cases from a corpus. So we've seen that well-written black box fuzzers can be very effective at finding vulnerabilities. But they have some problems. They tend to be quite slow, which means they require more resources to run. And they require considerable effort to write. So most of the time, we see that they're written by experienced security engineers, um, which makes this whole process kind of difficult to scale. So going back to the example of Chrome, we uh, use a variety of black box fuzzes to do uh, fuzzing against the entire Chrome binary. So we have HTML or DOM fuzzers to test Blink, which is Chrome's uh, rendering engine, and our various JavaScript web APIs. We also have JavaScript fuzzers to test V8, our uh, JavaScript engine. And on the right, you can see a snippet of one of the test cases generated by our fuzzer. And lastly, uh, as I mentioned before, we have a lot of IPC services. So we have fuzzers that fuzz these more privileged, privileged IPC services. We also support simulating uh, random user gestures. Uh, this is particularly useful when you're fuzzing an uh, application that has a GUI, as they can obviously trigger more code and hopefully cause more bugs to be triggered. So the thing with black box fuzzers is that they are dumb. They're not guided by any feedback from the target it's fuzzing, and they're purely based on the rules and algorithms of your fuzzer. So gray box fuzzing, on the other hand, is a slightly different approach to fuzzing. The AFL, or American Fuzzy Lop, started this revolution of sorts a few years ago with coverage guided fuzzing, which is a form of gray box fuzzing. The idea is that a fuzzing engine guides its mutations in a smart way by using the coverage feedback it gets from running the target it's fuzzing in a feedback loop. Uh, so AFL style fuzzing was really successful and it found countless bugs in many real world software and it's kind of become the de facto way to fuzz things these days. And then later, another team at Google developed something called LibFuzzer. And it's based on the same coverage guided uh, fuzzing principles as AFL. However, it's also in process, and it's aimed to make writing fuzzes more easy for general developers. And being in process it also means that sometimes it can be up to something like five times faster than an out of process AFL fuzzer. So with lift fuzzer, you can write a fuzzer in as little as five lines of code. And we call these things fuzz targets. So as you can see, it's very similar to writing something that might be, look like a unit test. And the idea is you write this stub function, which accepts in some data provided by the fuzzing engine. And then you just put this data and you pass it to some function or API that you want to fuzz. And then the fuzzing engine sees the code coverage from running the input data against this stub and then uses it to guide future mutations and get more interesting data for your fuzzer. And the great thing is you should be able to write this fuzz target once, and it should work seamlessly with multiple fuzzing engines like LiftFuzzer and AFL. So the great thing about gray box fuzzing is that you no longer have to write custom mutation or generation logic. The fuzzing engine can kind of learn the input format just by using this coverage feedback loop. And this becomes especially effective if you provide a dictionary or a seed corpus to help it get started. So ultimately, what this means is that general developers can very easily learn to write effective fuzzers. And this is, in fact, the key to how we scale our fuzzing. So when do we want gray box fuzzing and when do we want black box fuzzing? It turns out with a project like Chrome, we still need both. So gray box fuzzing is really great when you're fuzzing smaller, more targeted components. And it's great because you can educate developers easily to write them. 
and they can be thousands of times faster than an equivalent black box fuzzer. But we've also found that black box fuzzing is still uh, necessary. So we still want to do large integration style testing of applications rather than testing just the smaller individual components. And coverage guided fuzzing doesn't de tend to do very well with very large binaries, say with Chrome. And large real world programs can also sometimes be very uh, non deterministic, which again makes the coverage guidance less useful. And finally, you might have some very complex simple formats, say for example PDFs, where coverage guided fuzzing has some trouble uh, mutating and generating files in an effective way. So, we've also done some work to bridge some of the gaps between gray box and black box fuzzing. And we do this by making the gray box mutations more specific to the format that we're fuzzing. And one way to do this is to write a custom mutator or to uh, define the input format by using protobufs, using a library called libprotobuf mutator. So this is a bit of work, um, but we've had some great successes here. Uh, Abhishek mentioned the example with uh, SQLite. Um, so SQLite, as Abhishek mentioned, has 100% branched test coverage. And it's been well fuzzed by just playing gray box fuzzing for maybe a few years. And when we worked on a structured aware fuzzer for uh, SQLite, we ended up shaking out about, about a dozen or so new bugs. Some of them are uh, security vulnerabilities as well. Uh, if you want to find out more, uh, another member of our team called Jonathan Metzman gave a detailed talk on this uh, at Black Hat USA this year. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. Uh, so here's just a quick example of what this might look like. On the left, we define a protobuf that describes our input format, in this case, a SQL create table statement. Uh, so the fuzzing engine and libprotobuf mutator will take this uh, protobuf definition and generate protobufs that conform to this format. And then on the right, you have a fuzzer which takes this protobuf and then from it generates an actual SQL statement. And then this can be passed to the SQL engine uh, for fuzzing. So you can also imagine this approach working for testing API calls. So you can define uh, a protobuf message for every single function in your API or interface. And then in your fuzzer, you can take those protobufs and make the, uh, according, make the calls accordingly to fuzz the, the API interface. So as we mentioned already, the key to scaling fuzzing is not through just throwing more calls at the problem, but actually through educating developers. So as an example, uh, our team has a very modest uh, number of five security engineers, but we are responsible for the fuzzing of almost all of Google. So to get developers to actually write fuzzers, you have to remove as much friction as possible to help them get started. This means writing good documentation, good examples to point them to for writing a good efficient fuzzer, build system, su build system support, and stuff like that. Um, so more generally, what you want to do is make this gray box fuzzing through libfuzzer or AFL a first class citizen in the development process and make it as ubiquitous as writing a unit test. And one last note here is that developers uh, are often better at writing fuzzers than security engineers uh, using this approach because they understand their own code a lot better. So now that we have fuzzers, we need to set up a build pipeline. So fuzzers, fuzzers should be built with compile time instrumentation, such as address sanitizer and memory sanitizer. These are built into the Clang and LLVM uh, compilers, and they can help catch more memory safety issues at a very modest performance penalty. And address sanitizer actually works on most major platforms, including Windows. So we also need to build a fuzzing engine and compile the fuzzers with coverage in instrumentation for the fuzzing engine to do its magic. And once again, if you're using Clang, this can be as easy as adding a single uh, command line flag to the compilation flags. Uh, so one thing with most software we've noticed is that if you have asserts and similar debug logging in your code, uh, they tend not to do very well in the face of untrusted inputs. So they can cause very noisy crashes, which can actually hide nastier real crashes. So in the interest of speed and catching more interesting bugs, uh, we recommend fuzzing uh, a build where these de assertions are disabled. But if you're um, are dedicated and you want, still want to catch these assertion failures, you can still have an additional build to catch them. Another factor is optimization level. So we want fuzzers to be fast so they can explore more state faster. 
But at the same time, if you turn up the uh, optimization level of your compiler, that might do funny things like optimizing our branches. And this makes uh, coverage guided fuzzing worse. So you want to find a compromise between speed and being able to find bugs. And we've actually seen more bugs being found this way by turning down optimization levels. So if you're familiar with Clang or GCC optimization levels, you might want to set something like O1 as opposed to O0 or O2. And finally, this building infrastructure should be continuous and should automatically build uh, new revisions of your code base as often as possible. And ideally, it should be an extension of any existing build infrastructure, so you don't have to uh, have extra maintenance burden. And this, finally, these builds should be stored somewhere, maybe in a cloud, that is easily accessible by your fuzzing infrastructure. So now that we have builds, we can actually talk about the, the fuzzy machines. Uh, a rough approximation of how we scale our fuzzing in terms of our fuzzing bots is shown here. So the majority of our fuzzing is done on these cheap, preemptible, or spot uh, cloud VM ins instances. These are instances that are way cheaper, but they can be shut down at any time by the, the cloud infrastructure. The fuzzing itself uh, can be interrupted without much harm, so it doesn't matter. So we can scale a lot more cheaply by using these inst instances. However, we also have a bunch of more important tasks that we need our infrastructure to do that can't be interrupted, which we'll talk about in the later slides. So we have a very small number of more expensive machines carrying out these tasks. And these tasks are all just uh, distributed via a task queue that's uh, for every single platform we have. And then we have a global data store where we write crash data to. So on a single fuzzing bot, the first step of fuzzing is to pick which fuzz target to run. So in a large project like Chrome, you can have hundreds if not thousands of fuzz targets, and not all of them might be worth fuzzing. As an example, you might have a very simple fuzzer that's testing something like SHA-1 hashing. It's not very likely you'll find a memory corruption bug in that. Uh, on the other hand, you might have a fuzzer which is testing XML parsing, which is more complex than bug prone, bug prone uh, so you want to give more CPU cycles to that, especially when you have limited CPU resources. So what we do is we automatically prioritize which fuzz targets to run based on the stats and metrics we collect from them from running them already. So we want to prioritize targets that aren't tiny and that are actively gaining new coverage over targets that aren't uh, making much progress in getting new coverage or if they're very small over maybe targets that are crashing instantly because of some configuration issue. And also, some sanitizers are more useful than others. So address sanitizer uh, catches the majority of our security issues, so we give more cycles to address sanitizer. So every fuzzing target also builds up a corpus of inputs as it runs and gains coverage. This is shared between all fuzzing bots. So when a fuzzing job starts on a single fuzzy machine, it downloads the uh, current global corpus, and then starts fuzzing from that. And then once it's done, it might have found new inputs that cause new coverage, so it will upload those files back into the global corpus. Now, because we are fuzzing in parallel, it's possible that we'll be uploading redundant units that cover the same thing. So we have a periodic job that we call corpus printing that does something called uh, a corpus distillation on our global corpus. This means that we uh, take the corpus, and then we minimize it such that the number of files is as small as possible, but the coverage it, uh, the coverage it has is still the same. We also have this thing called a quarantine. Uh, occasionally, uh, things in your corpus might start crashing your target, and this would uh, kind of hinder your fuzzing because it will just bail out on that crash and not make any good progress. So for those cases, we will put those test cases into a quarantine, and once they stop crashing, we'll put them back into the main corpus. And we also have this trick called cross-pollination. This is where we take the corpus of other uh, fuzzers, and we try to add them to our corpus for our current target. Uh, this is useful if you have multiple fuzzers that are fuzzing the same or similar input format. So for example, if you have multiple JPEG libraries in your project, you would have something multiple uh, JPEG fuzzers. And it's very likely that the corpora for, the, for those two fuzzers can be shared. When it comes to fuzzing itself, there's also no perfect uh, search heuristic. 
For example, LibFuzzer comes with different optional uh, search strategies, such as value profiling, and also automatically uh, generated dictionaries. And additionally, we can apply our own search strategies, such as starting with only a subset of a global corpus instead of the entire corpus. And these can have really mixed results depending on which target they're used on. We also have additional mutators, such as Redamza, and we're working on an ML-based mutator as well. But again, these get mixed results based on which target uh, we use them on. So how do we tell which combination of fuzzing strategies to use? So ultimately, we want to pick the set of strategies such that we maximize the coverage growth of our target. But it's really not easy to figure this out ahead of time, uh, how, how often we want to run, uh, run a particular strategy with our limited set of CPUs. So there's an academic name for this, which is the multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, and how we try to solve this is we have a hard-coded table of, of uh, weights, and we, uh, on an initial set of runs, we pick random strategies based on those weights. And then on subsequent runs, because we have metrics and stats from those runs, we can use those to inform our future runs of uh, future strategy selection. So hopefully, what we end up with is we pick a set of strategies that's close to the optimal set for each target. Uh, now that we have a scalable fuzzing pipeline going, we're faced with another very important problem, which is how do we triage these thousands of crashes? So the first part of triage is the duplication. So what we do is for each crash, we generate a tuple. And the tuple consists of a crash type. The type of a crash can be like a user after three, a node dereference, stuff like that. We generate a crash state, which is a string derived from the stack trace and whether or not this crash is a security bug. So the crash state, which is generated from the uh, stack trace, is the most important part here. And it's taken as the top three interesting frames from the stack. So we filter out frames that aren't very interesting to us for the duplication purposes, such as inline frames like libc functions or just general logging functions. And in the case of out-of-memory conditions or timeouts, it's not easy to get a reliable stack trace uh, that's consistent for them so we only file one of those at a time. So let's go through an example. Here we have a crash in Chrome, uh, which is actually a debug check failure. And to generate the crash state for this, we take the error message from the D check failure, and then we skip over the first three frames. And the reason being is the first frame is a, a libc function that's not very interesting for deduplication. The second one is a, is a logging function, not interesting. And the third one is an inline frame, and it's very likely that it's not interesting for the deduplication purposes. So then we skip over those three and take the next two. And the result we have here is a string that's both human readable and also can be used as part of a key for deduplicating crashes. So while we have the, the duplication method I just described, it's not enough. Unique bugs can manifest with very similar but subtly different stack traces. So before we file any bugs, we do a second round of the duplication called grouping. We use something called string edit distance to compare all the crashes we have and group the ones that are under some threshold. And this has worked very, very well for us on real world, real world bugs. So on the right, we have uh, four crashes. They look very similar, but they're actually very subtly different. And it's very likely that they all have the same root cause. So instead of filing four bugs for these, we'll only file one bug. A lot of the time, providing a minimized reproducer is also very important to get a developer to fix a bug. They can, uh, otherwise, a very complicated reproducer will need more time to analyze and understand. It can also help make reproduction less flaky, because if you remove the unnecessary parts of a reproducer, those unnecessary parts could actually potentially prevent the actual bug from getting triggered. So fuzzer generated test cases can be hundreds of kilobytes, if not megabytes long. And we've found that most of the time, you can minimize this down to by orders, several orders of magnitude. So example here, we have a test case that's 43 kilobytes. We can minimize that down to 470 bytes. So if you use LibFuzzer and AFL, they have this functionality built into them, and it's very fast. If you have black box fuzzers, we also built our own black box minimization. It's a bit slower, 
but it works well with uh, more complicated test cases like HTML as well, because HTML can have dependencies, uh, you can have gestures, and you can have command line argument dependencies as well. And we handle all of them. Uh, in our experience, a large chunk of bugs that we find are actually regressions. Uh, the number here we have is 40%. Uh, so this just means most of the bugs Fuzzy finds uh, are bugs that are re recently introduced to the code base. And this is why continuous fuzzing is very important. So to help with triage, we perform a bisect or binary search to figure out which commit caused the bug. And we can reuse the exact same builds that we just used for fuzzing here. So, and the more frequent we get builds, the more precise the bisection range we get. So as an example, with Chrome, we build every single revision that we get in our code base. So a lot of the time, our bisects can point us to the exact commit that caused the regression. And this means we can revert far earlier and prevent code, a buggy code, from making it to production. And now Abhishek will continue. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. So some of our most useful features that we have in Plusfuzz came from developer requests. And this is an example of one of them. We call it variant analysis. What this really means is once developer gets a crash from a particular build configuration, they find it really hard to try to create all the possible build configuration just to understand the crash signature. To give you an example, a very uh, simple and important use case is a developer gets a crash from a release build, and they want to reproduce it again in a debug build just to know if it triggered any assertion because that can point to the root cause and maybe even the severity of the bug. So we do that automatically. And if you can think of different configurations, there can be many. Like think of the various sanitizers we have, like ASAN, MSAN, UBSAN, different platforms, architectures, like 32-bit, 64-bit, ARM, x86. So all this is done automatically. Another example I have here is sometimes it can help with understanding some of the root causes by just looking at the crash signature. So as you can see here, this is a bin utils library crash uh, that shows up as an undefined shift in UBSAN. So you will probably guess that this expression itself overflows. So uh, one of the first things that comes to mind is probably the size member itself is overflowed, and that's causing this expression to overflow. But when you look at the ASAN signature, it tells you it's a heap buffer, it's a global buffer overflow. What this really means is the, the overflow actually happened when accessing the size member. So something is really wrong with the opt-code pointer itself. So that's an easy analysis without trying to go through the hassle of reproducing through different builds. Now we have all the metadata for these crashes. These are all unique crashes. What do we do? You might think of a manual triager kicking in and trying to analyze each and every bug report and clicking a file button. Just to give you an example of our OSS first instance itself, we get like 150 bugs a week. That's really hard for any manual triager or triagers to go through. So with our proven deduplication method, we are able to file all bugs automatically without any developer annoyance. We also attach this special label called fuzz blocker. What this really means is if your fuzzer is running into some top crashes, we, these can be even like stability issues. We try to highlight it to the developer to fix them soon because they will make your fuzzer more pro productive and even finding more security vulnerabilities. Here are some examples of the crashes we found in the popular OpenSSL library. Many of these were just like one-day regressions, which the developer fixed before they could become anything serious or even made to any release channels. Here is an example test case report that we share with the developer. This includes all the crash metadata information. And another thing to highlight here is the stack trace section. So let's say if a developer starts working on a bug a week later from the original report, 
they still want to know the stack trace on tip of tree trunk. So we periodically update it automatically so that they don't get a stale version and where line numbers don't mismatch or there is, let's say, a code refactoring that has happened. Now, once you have a steady stream of these bugs, how do you prioritize fixing them? So with the volume of bugs that you will find or that we find, it's really hard to do uh, like uh, important and like in-depth exploitability analysis on each one of them. So let's say even if you have a team like Project Zero, you cannot really scale to analyzing hundreds of these bugs. So what we do here is we do a rough prioritization based on the crash types. These we deduce from the uh, what we get from the sanitizer stack trace. So for example, a use after free bug is classified as a security bug, whereas a null pointer dereference, which is 99% of the time not important, is classified as a functional bug. We also do some prioritization based on the product itself. So to give you an example of Chrome, we have different processes running at different privilege levels. So like a renderer uh, crash, which is in a sandbox process, is less severe than a browser process crash, which is unsandboxed. And finally, uh, we have filed this bug. Developer has fixed it. What do we do next? Do we really assume that the developer has fixed this correctly? In our experience with Chrome, we have seen developers making mistakes. And I think this is common with any product. Developers might test your fix incorrectly in a non-instrumented build. And what happens next is they will just ODA you when your release notes go out. So to avoid that kind of scenario, we make sure we verify the fix automatically as part of the infrastructure. And there is another advantage of this thing, which is if, let's say, an unrelated patch or a code refactoring fixed this bug, you get to know about it automatically and can uptake that fix early on. Finally, what else can you do? Uh, you can actually plug in your external reports that you get from your vulnerability rewards program into the fuzzing infrastructure itself. This is really beneficial and worked well for us because it gives us all the features of automated triage. So things like automated deduplication, fix verification comes for free. We have also taken it to the next level by hosting this thing called a fuzzer reward program. What this means is instead of a reporter running their fuzzer one time on their single machine under their desk, we run it continuously at scale on our cloud, and this gives even much better reports, and higher quality reports get filed ultimately in the bug tracker. We have reporters which have submitted fuzzers years back, and they are still finding new vulnerabilities because code regresses over time, and they get paid automatically. Now you have got all the bugs, you have fixed all the bugs, what do you ne do next? To get more bugs, you need to improve your fuzzers. So what we do here is we give these metrics to the fuzzer author to make changes to the fuzzer and make them more efficient. So one of the things uh, as an example here is execution speed. So we want the fuzzers to be fast. Uh, so we recommend like they should have at least 1,000 executions per second. We also recommend that they don't run into any blocking issues. So things like they shouldn't run into any out-of-memory issues, leaks, or timeouts. We also share this view, which we call as crash statistics. This gives a high-level overview to the developer on which top crashes their fuzzer is running into, what are the frequency for those crashes, and which platforms or, let's say, devices, like Android devices it impacts. And this one is kind of like developer's favorite, which is knowing what parts of the code that this first targets really hits. 
The unfortunate part here is code coverage cannot be really collected during fuzzing time. There are two reasons for it. One is it makes the first target extremely slow, like at least a 4 to 5x slowdown. And there is just too much data to accumulate for every fuzzing session. So things like which lines are covered, which functions are covered, which regions or expressions are covered, that's just too much data to capture in every fuzzing run. So what we do instead here is, in a daily run, we would run every fuzzer with the minimized corpus and use that to generate a per first target report and also combine them to like a per project uh, report. So let's discuss some more applications of fuzzing. Like everyone loves finding security bugs, but what else can we find? Fuzzing has been recently very useful, has been used to find correctness bugs. So to give you an example, we have this project called CryptoFuzz as part of our OSS Fuzz service. This tries to compare different cryptographic uh, applications to make sure that passing, let's say, the same input produces the same output, and it tests across libraries like OpenSSL, GNU, TLS, et cetera. You can also use uh, correctness fuzzing to compare different implementations of the same product across, let's say, different compilers or optimization levels. To give you an example, if you have code that you, it's written in handwritten assembly for performance and have also have a pure C implementation, you want to ensure that this handwritten assembly code is correct. So you can use it for that. And as we mentioned before, fuzzing really finds interesting and critical stability vulnerability, or uh, stability bugs. And if you fix those, you will have a more productive fuzzer. Fuzzing can also be used to guide your future design and development decisions. So to give you an example, Let's say you have a third-party library to integrate. Let's say JSON CPP, which is like a fast JSON parsing library. You want to ensure that three months later, when you upgrade to a new version of this library, it's still secure while being fast. So to make those decisions, you should ensure that that library is continuously first. And at least for the open source libraries, you can use OSS Fuzz as a prerequisite before integrating such libraries. Fuzzing has also been used to guide uh, some of the security mitigation efforts. So to give you an example, uh, like for better sandboxing or allocator hardening, where, let's say, an area of bugs uh, you have seen happening, you, you see bugs happening in a recurring fashion, so you can actually take a performance hit, and add those security mitigations. And finally, let's go over what results we have. So we have some great results across Chrome. This is where we started. Then we moved to OSS fuzzing, using our OSS fuzz service. And recently, we started fuzzing all of Google. Overall, we have found 40,000 bugs so far. This includes both stability uh, or like functional bugs and security bugs. In terms of just security vulnerabilities alone, we have found more than 8,500 issues in Chrome and OSS Fuzz. And the more important thing to know here is we don't just find bugs, we actually get them fixed. So thanks to this automated triage process, in OSS land, we have more than 91% of the bugs fixed. And that's something unheard of. Another thing we do is we do this one-on-one -on -one evangelism with the developers so that fuzzing becomes as ubiquitous as unit testing. We also hold like a yearly contest where developers compete on different fuzzer metrics in a leader's board style uh, in a leaderboard style fashion and uh, get fancy shrags. Many years it has helped us in even getting like, let's say, a 25% more first targets than before. 
We have some great results outside of Google as well. So our OSS first platform has a very visible impact on the security of the OSS ecosystem. So if you can think of uh, your favorite open source library, we have CVEs in those. So like uh, crypto libraries like OpenSSL, XML library like libxml2. Uh, we have even uh, CVEs in the larger browser engines like WebKit, Geico, and so on. So what is our plan for the near future? What's next? We have seen that 40% of the bugs we find are regressions. So we can stop some of them if actually we fuzz as part of your continuous integration. So like Travis or GitHub Actions, if we can, let's say, at least do like five minutes of fuzzing as part of every CL that gets checked in, before getting checked in, we can actually stop it and prevent the bug from being sneaked in the first place. The second idea we have is everyone in the industry focuses a lot on like mostly AFL and some focus on lift fuzzer fuzzing engines. But we really want to evaluate all the work that is coming from academics. Every year, there are at least 100 new research papers on fuzzing that use these artificial fuzzer benchmarks called LAVA-M. We want to really change that. We want to give them more real-world software to evaluate against and share that with the community at scale. We want to continue improving our, uh, our fuzzing efficiency. So we have some ideas on leveraging more of the different sanitizers. Like there is a new one called Data Flow Sanitizer, which can guide you towards which input bytes are better or will give better results when mutated. And finally, we want to support more languages. Right now, we have focused quite a lot on the memory unsafe languages like C, C++. We have uh, support in our infrastructure for Go and Rust, but we just want to add support for more languages. It should be pretty simple. It's just a few more parsing signatures. And that brings us to the end. I have three key takeaways for you. The first one is security should be, or fuzzing should be everyone's job, not just a fancy tool for your security team. It should be an integral part in the day-to-day -day development workflow. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to fuzzing. You have to combine different fuzzing engines like lift fuzzer, AFL, with the different fuzzing strategies we mentioned, like to give you an example, like value profiling, corpus subset, and mesh them together for optimal fuzzing performance. Finally, you don't really need to scale your security teams. You need to instead focus on automating your fuzzer workflows and scale fuzzer writing with the developers so that it becomes as ubiquitous as unit testing. To give you an example, we are a team of five, but we manage 5,000 first targets across Chrome, OSS, and all of Google. Thank you. That brings us to the end. <laughs> With that, we open the round to questions. Somewhere. Okay, not for the okay. Yeah. Uh. Um, hello. Yes. So, I have like a few questions. I don't know how much time we have, <laughs> but um, when uh, running the fuzzers, have you run into any synchronization issues with fuzzers when they are synchronizing the corpus and so on? Any concurrency issues? So most of the fuzzers are more unit test style fuzzers. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you really care about concurrency issues, you can run a build with like threat sanitizer, and mm -hmm. that will help you catch those data races. Uh, but we haven't really run into those things. Oh, do you remember? Do I think we have? Oh, OK. 
Um, the other one is I've seen that you have, uh, of course, facets for V8 and so on. Uh, which uh, which tooling do you use to generate that, the the grammar to fast V8? Do you use Domato? Do you use? Uh, most of our fuzzes, I believe, aren't open source. Um, we use open source like JavaScript parsing libraries to like at the AST and stuff. We have custom custom written fuzzers that mutate those ASTs and output the test cases that we use to fuzz them. Fuzz okay, yeah. and and could you name in any of these open source tools or uh, Domato is one of them or? Uh, so we use Babel in, in mm -hmm. one of our fuzzers. It's, that's a, a JavaScript library which parses JavaScript. Okay. Um, okay. And it also has abilities to turn ASTs into real JavaScript code, so it works for us. Okay, and uh, the, the last two questions. Um, do you have any, on, on, on ClusterFast, do you have any, any facets that attack uh, long-lived processes? And the last question is on type confusion bugs, which uh, usually they don't crash by themselves. Do you have a hardness? Do you have a template for these guys, uh, kind of bugs? So type confusion bugs you can easily catch with the undefined behavior sanitizer by enabling a V pointer check. So that explicitly catches type confusion bugs. Uh, for long lift processes, uh, we have both of these lift fuzzer based fuzzers which run for longer, like even hours at a time, so they will catch those things. For black box fuzzer, inside cluster fuzz itself, we have this uh, random randomized timeout. So for some of the runs, it will pick or run Chrome for longer duration than just the default, which is like 10 seconds or something. So it randomly picks those automatically. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. So I have two questions. The first is for V8. Have you tried to fast it with the lib protobuf mutator? So writing a JavaScript grammar. I saw some work on that, I think. Uh, we have, but uh, because V8 is kind of crazy under the hood, um, coverage guided fuzzing hasn't done so well for us. So for, for uh, examples are like non-determinism from the garbage collector and just the way it generates code um, under the hood just doesn't make it very effective when we apply coverage guide fuzz into it. Oh, I see. So for yeah. DOM and uh, JavaScript fuzzing, I would say the black box fuzzer have worked much better because there you can define different rules. And uh, the thing that really works well is if you mutate existing tests. So what we take is we take V8 tests, we take uh, JavaScript tests from other browsers, and uh, Oliver was mentioning this fuzzer, which does it like uh, combines those tests but understands their uh, structure or AST using Babel and then mutates those. Yes, yeah, so, so, so our black box JavaScript fuzzer just takes parts of test cases from uh, whatever we can find and then tries to mesh them together into something that makes sense to the engine. Uh, thanks. And the second question is you mentioned the corpus sharing, right? So. Do you do that automatically? Like you get, for example, some new JPEG parser and then you match the corpus that would fit those JPEG parsers automatically? Or how do you do it? So right now it's more randomized because we have these 5,000 targets. And when we do this corpus pruning once a day, we would cross-pollinate it with some of the corpuses from other fuzzers, like let's say five or 10 per day. Uh, we are working on doing this more intel intelligently by understanding the format uh, by this pollination method itself. Like when you do merging, you know the coverage of that uh, corpus, so you can intelligently know, oh, this corpus is from, let's say, uh, image files, or this corpus is, um, let's say, font files. So we are working on that, and that will be added in cluster for us pretty soon. Any other questions? Yes. Right here. Yes, thank you for the talk. I was wondering if machine learning could be interesting in producing some uh, fuzzing data. Yes, so as we mentioned uh, before, we have this mutator which actually improves the corpus itself using this machine learning model called RNN. What it does is it tries to train from different corpus items and then tries to produce similar looking test cases, which we think would be more valid than let's say a simple uh, mutator that LibFuzzer have. So we have some good results, especially on text-based formats for that, 
and it's already integrated as part of cluster first. Thank you. Any other questions? I think there's one in the back over there. Hi, thanks for, for the talk. So since there is another trend in fuzzing field which is called hybrid fuzzing, so if, uh, if like OSS fuzz try to combine like other techniques such as tent analysis or constraint solving, what well, it, what the point should we notice to like combining these two technology? Or is there any mm -hmm. future plan for Google to combine uh, this? So I believe we've tried countless of these fancy uh, concolic execution tools, and we haven't really had much success with them on real world programs. They tend to do um, well on like toy examples, but when you apply them to real examples in say OSS fuzz, uh, they don't do it very well. Um, at the same time, Abhishek mentioned we have a project where um, we invite academics to uh, to add their uh, work, their, their fuzzing engine work, um, to our evaluation service, uh, where we try to run benchmarks to actually figure out uh, what fuzzing techniques are actually useful in the real world. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, as you said, um, the function's name and the stack trace is very important when uh, dealing and grouping the crashes. What do you do when uh, the entire stack is corrupted and you cannot recover the stack uh, crash trace? Um. In many of the cases, like when we see a corrupted stack, we would, so for example, in a library that is not instrumented, we would just have like the library name. So we would just use that as a deduplication method. Or sometimes we would just use, let's say, the first target name itself. So there will be just one bug filed for that. Uh, but there isn't really a solution for those cases. Uh, we just have to fix the instrumentation part of the thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no. uh, I guess to expand on that, like, uh, if you're using like a dress sanitizer, most of the time, this is very rare because uh, like ASAN will catch it before the stack gets so corrupted. Um, and in the cases that we can't, we just have a placeholder uh, that get, everything gets kind of bucketed into. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. No, no. Uh, so this is not strictly a technical question, but uh, I think the biggest challenge for most people in this room in introducing fuzzing will be convincing the powers that be that this is a good investment. And you're saying you're doing this with a small team, but you've managed to push a lot of the work outside of it, right, to the developers. How do you sell that effectively uh, to your dev teams? Because this is uh, competing with feature development, et cetera. So any hints? <laughs> Okay, so the way we have made this really simple is we as a security team have first tried to make it simple in the build system itself, like supporting all of these memory sanitizer tools and making the fuzzer writing as simple as writing like just 20 lines of code. And once you have that, then if you talk to a developer and tell them like, oh, you write a unit test in 10 lines, you can write a fuzzer in 10 lines, and get really awesome bugs. And this is not just security, because that's another thing to interest people. It will catch user stability crashes in the wild. So we actually sell them on both. And that's how we are able to convince them. And the results speak for themselves. They get a bug, which they have written a 10-line fuzzer for, and they can fix it quickly and get the results. That's what excites them. It's how is this pipeline really automated? So. Uh, that has how it really worked well for us. Any other questions? Thank you, everyone, for staying that late. And enjoy you. your evening. <laughs>